All right, we're recording. And I am very happy to introduce Shafali Shori. Dr. Shori is an assistant professor at Alice Lee Center for Nursing Studies at the National University of Singapore. Her research focuses on family and women's health. She has designed psychosocial and educational interventions for varied populations and has conducted both systematic and integrative reviews. She has conducted both quantitative and qualitative studies involving national and international collaborations. And her research focus is on enhancing health outcomes, quality of care, and satisfaction with the quality of care received by participants. Dr. Shori has received various awards for her academic and research excellence and has been invited as a plenary speaker at various conferences presenting in national, regional, and international conferences, just like this one. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Shori, who's going to talk to us about first-time fathers' postnatal experiences and support needs in Singapore, a descriptive qualitative study. All right, Dr. Shori, you're on. Thank you very much, Sam, for such a kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me all loud and clear. Well, I can't see the responses, so it seems to be all right. And uh, before I begin, I would like to wish everyone, those who are midwives, or aspiring to be a midwife, to uh, a very happy International Midwifery Day. And uh, uh, as introduced by Sam, I'm Shafali, and I'll be presenting to you this topic entitled First Time Fathers Postnatal Experiences and Support Needs in Singapore, a Qualitative Study. And uh, before I begin, I just want to share with you, because it's a qualitative study, I will have a lot of verbatim from the participants, the fathers themselves. And uh, because in Singapore, uh, mostly we speak English, but with a bit of uh, Singapore accent, it's called Singlish. So you will see uh, some of the English in a bit different way, but I can, uh, I'll do my best to explain to you what pa participants are trying to say. So without further ado, let's begin. And before I start, I would like to... Hey, I'm moving. Okay. Yeah. Right. Before I begin, I would like to introduce a bit of the highlights of Singapore. And um, these are some of our important monuments. And I really wish that one day you decide to come to Singapore. It's a warm city and uh, hosted by a lot of warm people, a lot of good food, and a lot of sights to see. So, yes, before I begin, a warmest greetings from Singapore. Very low voice. Okay, I just heard somebody saying that the voice is very low and I'm going to do something about it. Just give me a minute. Let me know if that is all right. Okay, I've just turned on my mic and uh, the volume and just let me know if that is all right. Okay, thank you. Yes, Singapore is beautiful and let's begin with today's presentation. This is overview of my presentation. I'll be sharing with you the background of the studies, methodology, results, discussion and I'll end my presentation with some implications for both research as well as for the clinical practice. So let's start with the presentation. Early postpartum period is a stressful transition period for both parents, especially for fathers. Reason being fathers face numerous interpersonal and intrapersonal challenges like they feel frustrated, especially when they are not sure how they can support their partners, how they can look after their, wife, uh, their, their children, especially the newborns. They feel there is a lack of support from healthcare professionals, especially they feel that the nurses and midwives do not acknowledge them when they are in the hospitals with their partners and they felt restricted sense of freedom uh, after, uh, especially in the early postpartum period, reason being because they feel after giving birth they do not have the same amount of time, free time which they used to have with their partners or their wives. And that resulted them, some of them feel be, feeling being depressed and also unprepared in newborn care tasks. So several international bodies as well as national bodies like WHO and NIHCE, they have especially recommended that family members need to be involved to provide support to the new mothers in the early postpartum period. And uh, out of those family members, especially fathers being picked up, reason being because they spend a lot of time with the mothers and the newborns, that they need to be trained so that they can provide uh, good support to their wives or their partners. And involving fathers not only may enhance their self-efficacy, which is uh, in a very layman term uh, confidence, but it is not. Maybe we can discuss more during the Q&A session if you have some queries regarding self-efficacy and satisfaction. And it also decreases their fear and increase their trust in themselves that, that they can provide support to their wives and the newborn. And uh, it has also say, uh, shown in the literature that uh, 
supporting fathers in the early postpartum period does not just give benefits to the fathers, but it also provides support to their wives, especially it enhances their psycho-emotional benefit, not only for, their mo for the mothers, but also it helps in their uh, child's development. So, moving on, fathers' perceptions have been already explored in the literature. However, the focus always remains either during pregnancy or childbirth. Postnatal period is uh, definitely a period which is one of the most stressful period, period like I mentioned, for both parents, but uh, not much studies, or rather very few studies have explored fathers' experiences during this period. And uh, even those studies which are available, they are only focusing on fathers which is uh, just within three days of postpartum or after uh, six months or one year of, uh, of their child's birth. And also they have been focusing on a special things like if they are depressed or not. But the generalized experiences of fathers have been unexplored in the literature to the best of my knowledge. And uh, that's why it needs to be explored. And especially in Asian context, we have almost negligible studies which are exploring fathers' experiences. Especially when in Asia, the beliefs of fathers and values are influenced by our diverse culture, socioeconomic values, as well as political structures. Especially in Singapore, with rapid urbanization, globalization, and declining birth rates, I'm not sure anyone is aware, after Singapore is one of the top countries where our birth rate is very, very, very low. And we are doing all means to increase that birth rate, and that's why we have this pro-natal policies in Singapore lately. Uh, one of the things they have done is they have increased maternity leave, which was used to be one, one and a half month to four months for mothers, uh, only for those who are Singaporeans, not for the foreigners. And for the fathers, we used to have uh, only two uh, days of uh, uh, um, maternity leave. Now it has been increased to two weeks. So these are some of the uh, ways our government is working towards enhancing the birth uh, rate. However, a long way to go. And uh, previous local studies, uh, which has been conducted in Singapore, has focused only on mothers. And given the centrality of the cultural beliefs, as well as the determinant, which determine the fatherhood, it is important that we need to understand fathers' experiences from the local point of view. So that's the reason the aim of this study was to explore fathers' postnatal experiences and support needs after their partner's hospital discharge to provide evidence support to the improvement of the postnatal services in Singapore. So this study basically had two phases. Uh, I'm only presenting a part of phase one. Phase one was uh, supposed to uh, get experiences and support needs of fathers and mothers, explore that. And based on that, in phase two, we are developing and testing our intervention. Uh, if you need to know more about during Q&A, I can share with you. In fact, the educational intervention is already ready and the data collection for phase two is ongoing now. But for today's presentation, my focus is only on phase one, and I will be sharing only fathers' experiences and support needs. Right, so uh, descriptive qualitative research design will be used in this study, was used in this study, and data was collected from November 2015 to January 2016. Just recently, we have completed the data collection, and uh, purposive sampling was used to recruit first-time fathers. Now, you'll be wondering why uh, uh, this purposive sampling was used. The reason being, we wanted to actually represent the ethnic diversity in Singapore. Because in Singapore, we have Chinese as a major cultural group, followed by Malay, Indian, and some others. So we wanted to recruit representatives of all ethnicities, and that's why we used the purposive sampling. And participants were recruited from uh, a public hospital in Singapore. Are you OK so far? Am I too fast? Okay, I hope everything is going fine. All right, so this is the inclusion and exclusion criteria of uh, this study. Uh, participants, those who were 21 years of age or above, first-time fathers, able to read and speak English, and accompanying their partners uh, who are admitting in the hospital uh, in the delivery uh, room of a particular public hospital, as well as those who decided to stay in Singapore for two weeks after their partner's date of delivery were recruited in this study. Let me give you a bit more details why we have this uh, specific uh, uh, inclusion criteria. Now, you must be wondering why 21 and not 18 years old. Just to let you know, Singapore is, is unique, and we our legal uh, consent age, consenting age is 21 years old. So that's the reason for that. Now, first-time fathers, because the research has shown that the first-time fathers have more support needs than the fathers who already have kids before. So that's why we wanted to focus on first-time fathers only. And able to read and speak English because uh, as a recruiter, it's difficult to find a person who can speak 
lots of dialects. So that's why I know that's one of the limitations we only focus on English speaking fathers. And uh, we wanted fathers to be recruited from the hospital. That's why they were recruited when they were within the hospital with their wives after their babies was born. And lastly, they stayed in Singapore at least two weeks. Now, why two weeks was used for data collection? Because uh, research, again, our literature has shown that the first two weeks postpartum is one of the most stressful period for the new parents. And that's why we wanted to know their support needs and their experiences during this period. Exclusion criteria was uh, parents, or uh, the fathers, sorry, with the physical or mental disorders or their partners who have given birth to newborns with some deformities, complications, or their newborns been admitted to ICU, or lastly, if the baby is not discharged home. Again, the reason being we wanted father to be able to give us the detailed information about their experiences, and if the baby has not been discharged home with them, or the baby is still in the ICU, they will not be able to experience that fatherhood with the baby at home, and that's why uh, the, they were excluded from this study. And uh, we prepared an interview guide, a semi-structured interview guide was prepared in order to get um, uh, uh, information or solicit information on specific father's needs as well as their experiences. And uh, this uh, interview guide was prepared based on our previous study which we have done on uh, first-time mothers. And also this guide was content validated by the nurses, clinical nurses, because it's very important as an academic, we need to be in close contact with the clinical uh, clinicians so that we know that the information we are soliciting, it is relevant. And uh, this particular semi-structured guide was actually pilot uh, tested on one of the father and there was no changes were made in the questions we've been asked. And uh, at the end, when we analyzed this interview, uh, this particular pilot interview was also analyzed together. And total, we had 15 fathers who participated in these qualitative interviews. And how we got this number was based on data saturation. Our data was saturated at 13 participants and then we recruited one more and total 14 and the 15th was from the pilot interview. So total we had 15 fathers who in gave or provided us a great detail of information regarding their experiences and support. And we also not only just um, audio recorded these interviews but we also took field notes while these interviews were going on. This is especially to keep the objectivity of the data. And uh, we took uh, International uh, Review Board's approval and uh, we also had uh, consent taken from the pa uh, fathers and they were told that uh, the participa uh, participation of this um, in this study was based uh, totally voluntary and uh, if they wish at any time that they do not wish to participate, they can actually do so without any harm or without any um, issues to them as well as to their wives. PIS, which actually stands for Patient Information Sheet, it was provided with a detailed comment on what that study is all about. We give them all the information if they're gonna, if there's any harm, if there's any issue, who they can contact, if they have any concerns regarding the study. So all that information is about four A4 size page sheet. I'm sure many of you, those who are involved in research, we give such uh, patient information sheets to the uh, to the participants. And confidentiality was maintained in all time. And like I mentioned earlier, the participation in this study was voluntary. We used thematic analysis to analyze the data. Now, uh, those who are involved in qualitative study, I'm sure they will resonate with me. There are actually various ways we can uh, analyze the qualitative data. And uh, with my previous experiences, I've been using thematic analysis. And I'll give you a bit of glimpse how we do that. All interviews were conducted in English, like I said, and it was transcribed verbatim. That means they were audio recorded, and then we transcribed them in English to the written form. Interviewers and the PI read the interviews and the field notes several times in order to gain familiarity with the data. That's one of the first steps when we do thematic analysis, that we need to analyze the data, or rather get familiarized with the data very, very clearly. And when we do that, we don't only just focus on the transcribed verbatim, but we also take note of the uh, field notes which we have taken and especially we take note in those in those field notes we especially take note of special things for example if father is saying something he suddenly um, get emotional so we will write down in the field notes especially mentioning uh, this sentence the father was emotional so that we can analyze in light of a holistic view of of a father when we analyze the data and inductive analysis was used to identify interesting and relevant aspects Okay, so how I'm going to do the thematic analysis, I'm going to just give a bit of glimpse on that. It actually can be a two to three hours of a lecture how you do thematic analysis and some of them even do a proper qualitative module in our PhD curriculum here. But I will just give you a glimpse of that. 
in order to for me to come out with the themes out of this particular data I had actually use a color coded scheme I actually give a color to the similar meanings but I found in a particular transcript and then for example if something our fathers are talking about the emotional well-being that will be given pink code throughout uh, all the 15 interviews and then we will uh, consolidate them and then come up with the major themes umbrella themes which covers those uh, smaller codes so common concepts were linked together to form broader themes like I mentioned and uh, not only just one researcher but the two other co-researchers underwent the same process until unanimous agreement was reached to ensure the credibility of the findings. That means when I came up with the themes with my research assistant then the two other independent researchers did the same thing and we come up with the major themes to, uh, out of this data which I'll be sharing with you in the next slide. Okay. This is another, I'm sorry, this is going to be a bit, uh, it's an abstract information, but I'm sure those who are in research, they will appreciate that, that uh, whenever we do a qualitative study, we need to maintain the rigor in the study, especially for the qualitative studies like credibility, dependability, transfer transferability, confirmability, and authenticity. What does it mean? Basically, in credibility is that we, the data we are collecting, we have to, it has to be ongoing when we are collecting the data and analysis should be done at the same time. Reason being, when we are doing the analysis, we need to make sure that uh, if there is any new information is coming out and we, if we need to change the semi-structured guide which we have already prepared, we need to make some changes in those questions we are asking from the fathers. We also have a self-critical stance on research and preconception, especially, for example, I'm a midwife. If I'm collecting data, I've already done a literature review and I'm collecting data, I may have some preconceptions that fathers should say such things. So these field notes, it helps us to remain objective of our personal feelings and um, actions, feelings, and conflicts. So that was one. Then comes dependability. Uh, Audit trail of relevant documents used over the course of data collection and analysis are kept, including the interview guide, field notes, audio recordings, recordings and everything. And when we're going to publish this data, this information will be provided in order for the data to be dependable. And a clear presentation of the findings comes under transferability. For example, when I'm going to share with you in my uh, findings section very soon, you will see that I have actually given a verbatim, exact verbatim, without making any changes to them, what father spoke during those interviews. Confirmability means by maintaining research objectivity, something very uh, similar to credibility, audit trail, and authenticity is verbatim quotes, like I said, like transferability. So with this, we will be moving on to the findings now. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions so far. Uh, can I get some hints that if my speed is okay? Are we doing fine? Okay, so... I think Sam is typing yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Sam. So I'm moving on to the findings now. Right, so these are a little fast. I'm sorry, Lorraine. Okay, I'll slow down. Okay, great. Right timing for me to slow down now because I'm going to share with you the findings which are very interesting. All right, so this is the demographic profile of my fathers, the fathers we interviewed. The mean age of the father was 31. Uh, 31 years old and that is the main age of first time fathers in Singapore according to Singapore's demographic profile. Again, not surprisingly, Chinese was the main ethnicity. 40% of them were Chinese followed by Malay, Indian and others which was 20%. 100% of the participants, they were married and their highest education level, 66.7% of them had university degree and uh, all of them were employed, that means they were working at the time of interview and the monthly household income, um, income Singapore dollars, 73% fall in the range of 3,000 to 10,000. And uh, most of them, 80% of them did not attend antenatal classes, which may be shock to many of you. I'll share with you probably why. And uh, type of delivery mainly was the vaginal delivery and the support they received. Though we were having an interview, but even in the demographic profile, we tried to get some, solicit some information regarding the support they received from. And 46.7% uh, of them received support from other sources like internet and um, friends and uh, books and mobile apps. And 33% uh, received support from in-laws. That may be another interesting thing to some of you, which I'll be sharing with you soon. And paternity leave, which I like I said, it has just recently been introduced two weeks. We just wanted to know how many of you are out there of, of them already was using this paternity leave. It was only actually 6.7% uh, percent who was taking more than two weeks and 46% uh, was taking two weeks of maternity leave. They were still 
uh, quite a number or proportionate of uh, fathers who do not have maternity leave or they had maternity leave less than three weeks. So that's something I think a long way for us to uh, we'll go on this side of uh, why the paternity leave is not being uh, well utilized though it is being legalized by government. Okay, maybe I can share with you a bit of a details here on uh, why antenatal class has not been uh, used. Surprisingly, we, I also did a research on first-time mothers uh, a while ago and uh, the same thing uh, came out, the same findings we found that they do not attend antenatal classes. So uh, after further probing, we found out that in, uh, in Singapore, uh, for parents to attend antenatal classes, uh, they, they have to pay money for that. It is not free. So that's the reason uh, it is uh, something that it is not well liked by parents or well utilized by parents because it's not cheap when they have to pay for that antenatal class. So again, I'm repeating it's not free. I know I had a chance to go to a Nordic country. I went to Australia and that's not the case there. But here we have to pay for the antenatal classes. That's one. And um, secondly, like I said, support needs parent-in-laws. If you, if you see this here in um, Singapore, we, being an Asian country, I will show, share with you more in my findings that uh, these fathers, they are supporting their wives and uh, in-laws, I'm talking about if fathers, uh, I mean the, uh, the mother's uh, 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 wife's uh, parents and all that. So that's something very, very uh, uh, unique thing which we see because when we saw interview mothers, they were saying that they are getting more help uh, from their father's parents. So this is something very surprisingly. I think uh, it depends upon the on the on the build up of a family. In some families father's side is more dominating than the wife's side. So yeah, that's something to take note of. Okay, apologies for the small font size. Here I'm sharing with you and introducing to you the four main themes which we found out from our interviews. The four themes are no sense of reality to the sense of responsibility. That's how fathers felt and they felt unprepared and challenged. They had some support needs. They also mentioned uh, to us the sources they get that support from, experiences with the support and the attitude they had towards providing support to their wives, and lastly, future health for fathers. So these four themes, each theme has further sub-themes. So total we had 17 sub-themes. So first theme had four sub, uh, first uh, theme, which is no sense of reality to sense of responsibility, had four sub-themes. Then the number two theme, unprepared and challenged, had other four uh, sub-themes, followed by support and future help of others, which had five sub-themes. I know it's a bit confusing. Don't worry. I'm going to share with you one by one from each theme to the sub-theme with the patient's verbatim in, or the participant's verbatim in my next few slides. So let's begin. First theme, no sense of reality to the sense of responsibility. Fathers felt that till the baby was born, they did not have this sense that they are going to be a father. Most of them did not attend antenatal classes, like I mentioned earlier, could be the reason. They didn't really share with us the main reason, uh, though some of them said that they were not even aware of that those antenatal classes were, uh, were being introduced by the particular hospital. And those who attended the antenatal classes, they verbalized the need of teaching on real babies. So that's something very unique we found out with our fathers this, uh, in this study. They feel that during the antenatal classes, the very few who attended, or even during the postnatal period when they were being taught in the hospital, uh, they felt that nurses are using dolls or dummy babies, and they felt that that doesn't give them realism that they have a, or they, are, they had a baby or they're going to have a baby, especially during pregnancy when they're in hospital. Let me share with you one of the father, a Malay father. I just give a number in order to prevent confidentiality. It would be better if there is an actual baby. I would prefer the training to be realistic, like they are real life scenarios. I would not attend any classes where it is just a theory based. I can't relate to it. So fathers were looking for something they can relate to. First and foremost, they want a baby, a real baby. They wanted to hear the cries of the baby so that they feel that something we are going into it. And that something was shared by the mothers, though they didn't mention in the study about real babies and all that, but they did say that Sometimes when baby cries, that gives them a realism that they may feel the same thing. So yes, so that's one. And also fathers also felt that they should have more practical information rather than giving a theory-based information. So that was first sub-theme, which is no sense of reality. Moving on to feeling of joy versus frustration. Fathers felt overwhelming emotions from joy to anger, worry, fear, misery, and frustration. 
they seldom share their feelings with anyone. So, like one father, Chinese father mentioned, I had a sense of achievement as I felt when the baby starts crying and I managed to calm the baby down. It becomes very comfortable and when the baby starts sleeping and that's where I see the sense of joy to it and some achievement. So I think uh, that was something when fathers were able to be helpful or when the babies were responding or reciprocating to their help they were providing to the baby to felt a sense of joy. And um, another father, not so happy, he said like, when she's breastfeeding, a lot of time I'm just sitting next to my wife. She, he's mentioning about his partner. Then uh, just looking at the baby, but still I can't do the housework instead. It will be nice if I can provide more support mentally and physically to my wife because it doesn't affect me both. Like once I realize the sense of helplessness, it's a bit frustrating. So again, it, this study shows that fathers were willing to help. However, they were not sure how they can do that. So moving on to the next sub theme, need to bond with the baby. Fathers felt that it is important to establish strong family bond. They also tried to divide their attention between equally between their wife and the baby. And they also testified the need to understand their baby's cues as a means of bonding. Like Chinese father mentioned that um, I know it's a quite a heavy and in, uh, the, in the essence of time, I will just read the snippets of it. Trying to catch the different cues of what my baby is using, like sometimes when she cries, then you can know that she's hungry or even trying to know the feeding cues. I guess uh, for a whole relationship, it is important to bond with your baby. So fathers felt the need of bonding is important with their baby. Sense of responsibility. If you see from the beginning, they were frustrated, they were a bit lost and now slowly as the time passed by this, some fathers even felt a sense of responsibility. They do felt helpless, but as they were going into a relationship, like I said, they, they had this sense of responsibility as shared by one Indian father. He said, given that my wife uh, will still have to wake up, so in a sense it helps that I can empathize, you know, that's where she is going through, I mean, that's what she's going through because actually at the first few days she has difficulty coping, the need of having to wake up every hour. Yes, so I woke up with her, accompany her and handle the baby. So this father felt the sense of responsibility that it's not just my wife's job. He felt sorry for the wife actually. I've read the whole verbatim where he was mentioning that he felt that the wife is having sleepless nights while he was sleeping soundly. So he felt that it is equally his responsibility to provide support to the wife so he will wake up with the wife at night when she was sleeping. And uh, now moving on to theme two which is unprepared and challenged. We have just finished our uh, first theme with the four sub themes. Today, now I'm going to discuss with you unprepared and challenge the main theme and the first sub theme is unaware of any educational support available. Though from the first time mothers we felt that money could be an issue that they did not attend antenatal classes but with this study it is more clearer now that more than half of the fathers were not prepared and educated about the support they could provide. They were disappointed on unawareness about the educational programs offered by the hospital. One Malay father is mentioning. Actually, I was not aware of such classes. There is no awareness for me. If there was, maybe I can consider attending depending on the price, depending upon the type of content or even the scope of the program. So again, though yes, money was is always important, that could be one of the factors, but even unawareness about the classes, there was something this father's mentioned in this study. Moving on to a second sub theme. Sleep deprived, I'm sure. This one uh, most of us will relate to and a lot of literature has been done on that that almost all the fathers reported some degree of sleep deprivation. They felt bad for their wives as the mothers needed to be up for the feeding at night, especially those who were breastfeeding. And Filipino fathers, he's mentioning that, yeah, the sleeping pattern is not, no longer the same. It's been very tiring. Baby's up around 10 a.m., no, 10 p.m. And then he's wake up until maybe 7. That's why sleeping pattern is not the same. So... That's what these fathers are saying, which like I said, many literatures have shown before that sleep deprived is one major issue which parents are feeling after having a newborn baby, especially in the first two weeks postpartum. Another sub theme which is confused, almost all the fathers felt confused about the amount of support they could provide to their wives. Their confusion was further aggravated when they received varying advice from the family members and healthcare professionals. And that is something, a big issue here in Singapore, I'll, mention, I'll share with you more. Physician nurses, this Malay father is mentioning, physician nurses and midwives can teach you different things because when we went to clinic, okay, this person is trying to say that when he went to clinic, this doctor say it's okay to feed uh, your baby formula, but when this couple went to the nurse, then the nurse actually scolded them and said that 
no, it should be always breastfeeding, no formula. So they were very confused. They were not sure which or who to follow. That's one. That's from the healthcare professionals. Even with the family members, they have a lot of confusions. I didn't put a quote here. The examples are like the family members, many of the older generation feel that the breastfeeding is not important. A uh, baby when cries, the baby will get dehydrated and that's why formula is, uh, is, is the way to go. So that's why many young parents are having this tug of war with their older parents who feel that uh, uh, breastfeeding is the way to go. So yeah, uh, sorry, the formula feeding is the way to go and that's why that is a challenge to many new couples they face. Lacking confidence, a father's perceived lack of confidence in looking after their newborns, they felt clueless to answer their wives. So especially this father is saying, Chinese father, mentally difficult when your wife asks questions, I cannot answer. So this father was, uh, you know, he, he was even saying that uh, sometimes wife will say why she's having pain despite of giving, uh, uh, expressing out the milk or giving uh, milk to the baby. And uh, so he said that because he cannot answer, he felt so helpless that he will change the topic. I try to talk about something not so serious. I talk about baby and things like that. So so that she can forget what she's asking. But just imagine, you know, how frustrating it is for these fathers. And uh, they felt that they do not have even confidence. They have not been prepared what they can actually answer to their wife. And then comes to support needs, which is our theme three. In uh, this, I will be mentioning basic, basically about social support, their needs, sources, experiences, and attitudes. So support needs. Formula, uh, formal informational support on topics such as baby bathing, diaper change and carrying the baby and how to support the wife. These fathers specially mentioned that these topics must need to be uh, uh, educated to them when they are in the hospital before they go home or during even in the antenatal classes. They felt that even uh, they were able to provide some help. There was this father who was mentioning that he actually get together some information when a nurse was teaching his wife. And uh, despite of that, he felt that when he did some uh, some support or provide some support to the wife, he had lack of feedback on the care he's providing. He was not sure whether he's doing things correctly or not. And emotional support, they felt it was lacking and they were finding their own ways of uh, getting themselves supported by, talk in the, by engaging in self-talks or by talking to their friends or their uh, fathers or uncles or especially the male figures in their life. This father, Chinese father is mentioning, I won't get myself too stressed because I, I get if I get stressed, my wife will get stressed because I don't want my wife to get postnatal depression. So I will be talking to myself and sometimes we even talk to the baby. So that shows that, you know, we, we often feel, especially in our Asian society, that males are very stoic figure and they do not really need any support, especially emotional. But look at fathers. They are crying out loud there that they do need this support. They want someone to listen to them, provide them feedback on how they can provide support to their wife. Sources of support, formally they were getting from nurses and midwives when they were in the hospital. Informal, they got it from their in-laws, especially mother-in-laws and friends and social medias and YouTube were their hot favorites. Non-Singaporean fathers, they had their family flew down from their, from their native countries and uh, very few non-Singaporean fathers decided to bring the baby back as it was very difficult for them to get their family back here because of the visa issues and then they felt that in order uh, to provide a good care to the baby, they decided to bring the baby back to the, their hometown like this Filipino father. It's really hard not having anyone around so we want to go home but we have to wait because of the documents and eventually they will be bringing the baby back home to get more support for mother as well as baby. Experiences of the received uh, support. This is very sad because the fathers felt left out by the nurses and wish nurses can acknowledge their support needs. They felt happy for the added support received from their parents and in-laws. Chinese fathers, especially those who were local with overseas in-laws, they felt that sometimes they had this unique pressure because they were asked to follow certain practices, especially confinement practices. I'm not sure this word confinement is how familiar it is with the audience here. Just to let you know, I know commonly in literature they use the word called doing the month. That means First 40 days after giving birth, the postnatal period, the woman is confined in the house literally and they are not allowed to do uh, go out of the house and also according to the cultural ethnicity being the Indian, Malay or Chinese, they follow certain rituals and some of the rituals I can share with you quickly is for example, they can't take shower, they have to take warm food, they can't take cold water and uh, they can't take ginger, they have to take certain herbs so and so forth. It's a long list. Actually, there's some publications done on this. So local context, yeah. And uh, like this father said, the nurses were focusing on my wife and I do not have much impression about nursing approach, nurses approaching me. So yeah, that's sad. Attitude towards 
support provided unique to the cultural ethnicity fathers had different attitude in providing support that's something very unique we found in this study malay fathers they believed that child care is primarily mothers and female relatives role and mothers should sought help from female relatives he felt that fathers are the breadwinners and they should there should not be any role confusion between uh, fathers and mothers and most of the times like this malay father said uh, things are done by my wife and mother in law i don't think i need to support the wife needs to be a mother husband needs to be the uh, support for the mother and the child and there should not be any role confusion moving on to educational programs specially focused on fathers almost all the fathers stated there is a need of involving them in educational program and they specially wanted the special programs for themselves they recommended to plan the programs within first two weeks postpartum as they feel more stressed and they also requested to use real babies as we mentioned earlier not the dolls uh this chinese father is sharing one thing is uh we want to know uh so we get more involved and we want to know tell us exactly what we have to do involve us more so that we will feel more important and he had a laugh on that that we really want to be involved in supporting our wife after she has given birth uh future health for fathers this is my theme for a uh, continuity of care from uh, sorry i just wanted to i didn't highlight this this is my i have started my theme for now the first one was educational programs that is first sub theme now is continuity of care from healthcare professionals as fathers trusted the advice from the nurses and doctors the they requested that the continuity of care there should be some source of uh, information still uh, be uh, provided to them by nurses and doctors again this could be a uh, something strange for the audience here just to share with you all um number one is that in singapore we do not have continuity of care in the form of home visits by any community nurses or midwives and uh, and nurses provided to the mothers and fathers or rather babies after they have given birth so that's why these fathers are asking if they can or they receive some information from uh these healthcare professionals they will feel more trustworthy and they will feel more assured it was also highlighted that fathers should not be seen separate from their wives in providing informational support by their professionals like this chinese father say that it will be good that i could connect to the professionals after my wife has discharged information is provided by the professionals from the real like doctors and nurses so at least this information is reliable i can trust this information so yeah that was something is also shared by the mothers in our previous study use of technology especially mobile health applications surprisingly was uh, mentioned by all the fathers they said that mobile health will be very useful but information in the app has to come from the professionals they were very very uh 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 careful that the information they should receive it should come from professionals especially many fathers mentioned that they were looking at videos from youtube however their main issue they had was that whether those videos are reliable or not so that's why they will spend lot of time looking through the comments to see whether they can trust that video or not so that's why they say the technology should be there to support them but the information still should come from the professionals and lastly Holly, this is Sam I'm so fathers I'm so sorry to cut in, but we're re almost running up to the end of our our time, and want to leave some time for questions. Do you think you could kind of sum up things so that people could ask the questions that they have in the next couple minutes? Sure, I can finish another five minutes. Okay, all right. Because of the time, I need to. I know I had a lot of verb time. I will be finishing my study very or my presentation very soon. Another five minutes so that you can ask me questions. Focus group discussions with fathers. uh they were asking that it will be nice that they can have some support from the fellow fathers who can share their experiences so lastly advertising the educational program they feel that the, if the programs can be advertised by the hospital so that they are aware there are such programs available so with this i'll just share with you that uh, as found in the previous literature this study also shows that fathers undergo changes from feelings of joy to frustration they also feel the dolls uh in the educational pro program distance them from the reality of having baby like in previous studies and similar to fathers from many other parts of the world fathers felt sleep deprived fathers also felt unaware of uh, available educational programs and they also received differing advices on confusing advices from nurses and that has been mentioned in previous literature that nurses need to be very mindful when they provide support and the care and education to the parents you need to asian context in this study filial piety was seen among the um chinese fathers especially when uh, even though they were receiving differing advices from their elders they were still very thankful to them 
This was in contrast to the study in Hong Kong where mothers felt actually depressed receiving such differing advices from their in-laws. This could be because in Singapore or rather in Asia, uh, this fathers they receive a lot of respect from the in-laws and uh, that could be the reason they were able to negotiate some sort of uh, uh, you know the practices they they were negotiating with them if they could not it, it's okay for them not to follow those uh, practices fathers lacked informational support like in previous study and also unique to the malay fathers they believe the newborn task should be uh, focused by only female. This could be because of our cultural beliefs and also religious belief. Because in Singapore, there is a Confucian Indian and uh, Confucius Indian and uh, and um, Islamic belief so very popular. So that could have uh, uh, you know uh, give this certain beliefs which some fa fathers had. In contrast to study among local mothers, fathers prefer the continuity of support in form of informational technology. We had it's a single uh, center study and sampling was based only on English speaking people and that's why it's one of the limitations and interviews were conducted only once within two weeks. We feel that in future study we should have longitudinal study with more information soliciting at different time period postpartum and uh, clinically we feel nurses and midwives need to target uh, on ethnic diversity when they are providing information, new fathers need to be addressed by their needs and they should be personally invited in the educational program. Listening to fathers are very important so that we can understand their unique needs and can plan educational programs according to their needs. Constructive feedback on fathers' performance on the various tasks is equally important and the family-based continuity of care is very important and it should be a routine care in every hospital in our local context. Use of informational technology in providing information can be used in uh, clinical settings and that's what we are doing in my phase two now. We are actually coming up with a mobile health app educational program for these parents. For research, like I mentioned earlier, future research should examine the needs and experiences both first time and experienced fathers to see any comparisons. Longitudinal cohort study should be done and effectiveness of targeted holistic support through antenatal and postnatal parental education should be tested. And lastly, research involved with technology, which we are already doing this. So in summary, like I mentioned, the fatherhood can be very challenging, frustrating. However, we can make it joyful and uh, happy for both uh, father, mother and as well as for their uh, family uh, by providing them adequate support, by listening to them and then uh, soliciting uh, information from them and then to, uh, coming up with a tailor-made educational program which is specific and unique to them as well as to their family. Thank you very much and that's, this is a publication. Uh, it's under review from this particular study. And this study has been um, given a grant from National University of Singapore Startup Grant. And uh, let's have some Q&A. All right. Unfortunately, we don't have too much time for questions because we want to give everyone a few minutes to take a break before the next session. But if we have, if anybody has a really burning question that they want to ask, now is the time. We'd be happy to take it. Thank you, Gemma. Gemma, thank you very much. All right, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Well, I want to thank Shafali for that wonderful presentation about fathers. I think sometimes the fathers get forgotten in all of this. Um, and that was a really, really important presentation. So thank you very much. And everyone, happy International Day of the Midwife and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care, Sam. Thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you.